the first lecture of this semester is electric charge and electric field. During this lecture today, on Tuesday, we will finish the part related to the electric charge and next lecture on Thursday, we will continue with the electric field and electric field of dipoles. What we have within this chapter, we will learn how objects become electrically charged, positively charged or negatively charged. In addition to that, we will learn how we know that electric charge is conserved. If you have an isolated system, electric charge is conserved. We will discuss this one. And we will use Coulomb's law to calculate the electric force between charges. So here we have one charge with the name of Q1, and on the right side we have another charge with the name of Q2. Then, depending on their charges, negative charge or positive charge, they attract each other or they repel each other. So we will calculate the electric force between these charges by using the Coulomb's law. In addition to that, we will discuss the difference between electric force and electric field. They are completely different things. Of course, there is a relation in between. And we will learn how to use the idea of electric field lines. This word important, this definition is important. Electric field lines to visualize and interpret electric fields. And finally, we will finish this chapter with the calculation of the properties of electric charge distributions, including electric dipoles. So let me start with the importance of this chapter. As I told you at the beginning of my talk, this lecture, this part of the university physics is very important for biology, for chemistry, for physics, and also many field of the industry, many field of the engineering. So what is the relation between electricity and our daily life? So here you see a water, okay? We have to drink several liters to be alive per day, okay? So what is the importance of water for our daily life? Water is very important solvent, okay? And very good solvent. So you eat something and there are many biological molecules within the foods and they are very important for our body. And these biological molecules are dissolved within the water. Okay, so without water, you cannot think about the life. So how water can be a good solvent? This is very important question. You know, water is, let me write. So here you see two hydrogen atom and one oxygen atom, and this is water molecule, and it is very good solvent how it could be possible. What is the reason for this? So within this lecture, we will learn that, okay? So it is related to the electricity. And as I told you, we will learn during this semester electromagnetism. So more or less the half part of this semester will be devoted to the electricity and electricity related topics. and Another half will be related to the magnetism and also electromagnetism. So we will cover all these topics within this semester. And first of all, we will start with electric charge and electric fields within this chapter. So now let me start from the basics. Look at this plastic rod here. Here we have a plastic rod and it is neutral, okay? There is no charge on this plastic rod. And here we have another plastic rod on the right side, and this is also neutral. It has no charge. So then they 
don't attract or don't repel each other. Okay, so you cannot consider any electric forces in between. But just take these two plastic rods and put them on fur. This is the fur here. And if you rub them with the piece of fur, then you will see that they repel each other. So after touching or after rubbing these plastic rods with the piece of fur, this plastic rod will be negatively charged and the other one will also be negatively charged. And so since both of them are negatively charged, they will repel each other. Okay, so now let's have a look at this example. Here we have a glass rod. This is hanged. And there is another glass rod. They are neutral. They have no charge. So they do not attract each other or they do not repel each other. So then I put this glass rod here on a silk and both of them are positively charged, okay? Then they repel each other since both of them are positively charged. So now just extend this example. Here we have a plastic rod. This is the fur rubbed plastic rod. So you know after rubbing with the fur, plastic rod becomes negatively charged and after rubbing the glass rod with the silk glass is positively charged and if you make them close to each other then they will attract each other okay because this plastic rod is negatively charged on the right side we have positively charged glass rod and they will attract each other let me write on this picture here. This is the fur positively charged and this is the silk negatively charged. OK, and this is the glass rod and this is the plastic. OK, so fur is positively charged and here we have negatively charged plastic rod and there is an attractive force in between and here we have positively charged glass on top and here on the right side we have negatively charged silk and they attract each other. Here I should talk about the electrostatic forces and the term electrostatic. So what is the meaning of this word? Actually here it is defined but I forgot to mention this one. In electrostatics, we consider that the interactions between electric charges are at rest or nearly at rest. OK, here we have positive charges and let's consider here we have negative charges and we consider that these positive and negative charges are at rest or nearly at rest. OK, this is the electrostatics. But in reality, in metals, in many materials, for example, electrons are traveling within the material. OK, so they are moving. So but within the scope of electrostatics, we consider that electric charges are at rest or nearly at rest. So don't forget this term then. Let me continue with the operation of a laser pointer. Do you have any question until this part? OK, let me continue with the operation of a laser printer. It is very easy to understand. Please listen and follow carefully. So I will continue step by step. This is the step one. Here we have a wire. Here we have a wire. And this wire sprays ions onto drum. This is the drum. 
this one. This is the rotating imaging drum. And here we have a wire and this wire sprays ions, positive ions. Let me put here positive symbol, positive ions on the drum, giving the drum a positive charge. So here we have a positive charge source, let's say. Here we have a positive charge source, a wire. And then this puts positive charges on the drum, okay? Many positive charges. So then in the second step, there is a laser and this laser beam writes on the drum leaving negatively charged areas where the image will be. So here we have a laser source, let's say, okay? And then laser comes here. So at the beginning, this part was positively charged and due to laser, this becomes negatively charged. If you don't have any laser here, here we have a wire and it sprays positive ions onto the drum. And after this wire, the surface of the drum will be positively charged. It is rotating, okay? It is rotating. And due to the sprayed positive ions, the surface of the drum will be completely positively charged. But here we have a laser beam. And when laser beam hits on this surface of the drum, then this part becomes negatively charged. OK, so you decide which part will be negatively charged and which part will be positively charged. So then here we have toner. Toner is positively charged, okay? You know the toner in laser printers. It is positively charged, many positively charged dust particles, let's say. And what do you see here? Positively charged toner material here. Positively charged toner material. And here we have positive areas. So positive charges will repel positive charges on the toner, but here we have some negatively charged areas. Let me change the color of the pen and then let me continue. Okay, here we have negatively charged areas and I produce this negatively charged areas by using a laser here. Okay, then so for this reason, the name is laser printer, okay? So here we have negatively charged areas and here we have positively charged toner material and then they will attract each other, okay? Then toner material will come here on this surface, okay? Due to the attractive forces between negatively charged drum surface and positively charged toner material. Okay, so then this part. Step three, roller applies positively charged toner to drum. Toner adheres only to negatively charged areas of the drum written by the laser. I hope this part is clear. So the working principle is completely explained here. So then, what about the writing on the paper? It is the next step. Let me change the color of the pen again. So here we have toner material in this area, you see, because drum surface is negatively charged here. Again, here we have toner material, and here we have toner material, okay? So how laser decides this negatively charged areas. You decide for the negatively charged areas. You send comments to the printer and you say that, please write these areas and don't write on these areas, okay? Then by using the laser, you produce negatively charged areas on the drum and this negatively charged areas attract the positively charged toner material and then you have this type of 
condition. So now the step four. Here there are wires. These are the negatively charged wires. OK, here we have negatively charged areas on the drum and here we have negatively charged areas um, wires, but this negatively charged wires have a stronger. Negative charge. So here this is the paper. This is the paper source and papers are coming from the paper source and whenever paper enters into this area, the paper is negatively charged and this negative charges are much stronger than the negative charges on the drum. Then they attract. The positively charged toner material. OK, then here we have toner material on the paper, toner material on the paper and others will come on the paper. So this is the final step. There are fuser rollers heat paper so toner remains permanently attached okay so this this rollers they contain heaters and heat the paper when you take the written paper from the laser printer you feel that it is a little bit hot okay so this is used to permanently attach the toner material on the surface of the paper. Then finally. Here we have a lamp and this lamp discharges the drum. Readying it to start the process over. So after this lamp, there will be no charge here. There will be no positive charge or there will be no negative charge. OK, so this part of the drum will be neutral after this lamp. So this is the operation principle of a laser printer and it is exactly based on the electric charges. Do you have any question here in this part in this very nice example? I hope it is clear. If it is not clear, you can check the book. It is also discussed in, in, in within the book. So now let me continue with the electric charge and the structure of matter. You know, every material, every molecule made from atoms, OK? And within the atoms, we have nucleus, nucleus in Turkish Çekirdek, it contains protons and neutrons. OK, within the nucleus of the atom, there are protons and neutrons. And around this nucleus, in certain orbits, according to the Bohr atomic model, electrons are traveling. OK, so within the nucleus, we have protons plus neutrons. OK, and protons are positively charged and neutrons. Have no charge, they are neutral, OK? And here we have electrons, electrons are negatively charged. So now let's discuss the electric charges within the atom. So on the right side here, we have a magnified picture of the nucleus and atom structure. OK, here you see. Negatively charged electrons with the blue color or dark blue color. Let me show you here. Here we have an electron negatively charged. Here we have an electron negatively charged and here we have an electron negatively charged and here. Let's say in the center of the atom, we have very small nucleus. OK, size of this nucleus compared to the atom is very small. And within the nucleus, we have protons and neutrons. Let me choose another color here. So this is 
what we have this in the nucleus. We have positively charged protons, red balls here, and here we have neutrons which don't have any charge, okay? These gray balls are the neutrons, and this is the nucleus. What about the size of the nucleus? The size of the nucleus is about 10 to minus 15 meter, which is also called as one Fermi, okay? Very, very small. What about the size of the atom? So around the nucleus, there are many electrons. Electrons are traveling in certain orbits with certain energies. And the radius of the atom is around 10 to minus 10 meter. 10 to minus 10 meter is one angstrom. Okay. So the radius of the nucleus is around one Fermi, but the radius of the atom is around angstrom. Okay. It depends on the number of the electrons, it depends on the number of protons and neutrons, and it changes from one atom to another atom. But it is on the range of angstrom for the atom radius and around the Fermi for the nucleus. Okay, so these are the distances. So now let me discuss the charges. Here we have very nice information. Maybe you already know. The nucleus is very tiny, very small compared with the rest of the atom. So this is the radius of the atom, you see. And nucleus is here. Nucleus is very, very small. You can see from the distances, okay? But this part is very important the nucleus contains over 99.9% .9 of the atom's mass, okay? It is very small in size, but its mass is huge, okay? It contains over 99.9% .9 of the atom mass. Other mass comes from the electrons. OK, and electrons are traveling in certain orbit around this nucleus and they are distributed sparsely. OK, so nucleus is very dense, but electrons are distributed sparsely. Do you have any question here in this part? OK, now. Here, let me discuss the electric charge in the atom. We are talking about the electric charges, right? Then we have defined the atom. We know the atom structure. And what about the electric charge of the atom? We know that the electrons are negatively charged. For example, here you see this atom has three electrons and three negative charges, and within the nucleus, what do you see? Within the nucleus, we have three protons, and protons are positively charged, okay? And we have four neutrons here, and neutrons are neutral. So, three positive charge here, and three negative charge here due to the electrons, so in total, what about the total charge, total electric charge of this atom? For this atom, the total electric charge is zero. It is neutral because electric charge of each electron and electric charge of each proton are equal to each other with the opposite signs, okay? And we are talking about ions in our daily life, in other lectures, in chemistry, in biology, we are talking about ions, okay? Positively charged ions, negatively charged ions. Then we will discuss this one. So I have already explained 
here on the right side, we have a neutral atom, which has the same number of protons as electrons, okay? This is the neutral lithium atom. It has three protons here in the nucleus, three protons, they are positively charged, and there are four neutrons, but they are neutral, no contribution to the electric charge. And we have three electrons. So due to these three electrons, we have three negative charges and they cancel each other. Protons and electrons cancel each other. Then finally, this atom has zero net charge. Okay, it is neutral atom. Then what about the positive ion? Here on the right side, we have positive lithium ion, lithium plus. What do you see here? We have three protons in the nucleus of the lithium ion. We have four neutrons, and here we have two electrons, three protons, two electrons, and in total, we have positive net charge. So this is the positive ion because it has fewer electrons than protons. Then what about the negative ion? Here again, we have negative, negative lithium ion, lithium minus. Here we have positively charged three protons. We have neutral four neutrons. And then we have one, two, three, four electrons, okay? We have one more electron compared to the proton numbers. Then in total, this atom has negative net charge and then it is negative ion. Do you have any question here? Okay, then let me continue with the conservation of charge. In the physics one during the last semester, you have seen conservation of energy, you have seen conservation of momentum, okay? And conservation of angular momentum, you have learned many conservation mechanisms, okay? So you already know the idea, and now we will apply this idea to the electric charges. The proton and electron have the same magnitude charge, I have already told you, but proton is positively charged and electron is negatively charged, but in magnitude, their charges are same, okay? Let's consider you have a single proton, for example, here in this picture, a single proton, and it has certain positive charge, okay? Or you have a single electron and it has negative charge. The magnitude of this charge of the electron or the magnitude of the positive charge of the proton is a natural unit of charge, okay? And other charges of the materials are calculated with this natural unit of charge. And for this reason, all observable charge is quantized in this unit. Here I have negatively charged electron and it has certain magnitude of charge. And here we have positively charged proton, let's say, and it has certain magnitude of charge. And in magnitude, they are equal to each other. And this is a natural unit of charge. This is also a natural unit of charge and all other charges are quantized in this unit. And what about the title? In the title, we discuss the conservation of charge. So what about this term? Here, we have a single atom. Let's consider this is again a lithium atom neutral lithium atom 
it has three electrons and it has three protons. In total, this atom has zero net charge, okay? If this atom is isolated, then the electric charge of this atom is constant, okay? And you can apply this idea to any system the algebraic sum of all the electric charges in any closed system is constant. If you isolate, electrically isolate your system, then the electric charge of the system is constant. This is the principle of charge conservation. Okay, here within this example, again, I would like to express the importance of electric charges for our daily life. Here you see a skier, and this is the rope. You see, this is the rope goes to motor yacht, for example, okay? And then this guy holds this rod here, and this is the rope and it goes with some certain velocity on the surface of the water, okay? And what about the forces on this water skier? Most of the forces are electric. So if I ask you what, what kind of forces are acting on this guy, you can tell me gravity due to the mass, right? And you can also tell me the friction force on the surface of the water, or you can tell me another force, fluid resistance, and there is a tension force, right? Tension force on the rope. So there are many forces here acting on the guy, but most of these forces are electric, electric interactions, between adjacent molecules give rise to the force of the water on the ski. So here there is a water, you see, and this is the surface of this uh, skateboard, let's say, okay? And this skateboard, let's say this one, is made from molecules from atoms, okay? The interactions based on the electric interactions, the, the interaction between the adjacent atoms. So this, this skateboard is made from many atoms, many molecules, and there are electric interactions between adjacent molecules. And this skateboard is moving on water. Water is also made from these molecules, okay? And there are also electric interactions between the molecules and there are electric interactions between the skateboard and water molecules. And in addition to that, the tension in the rope here, this rope is also made from the molecules, from the atoms, and there are electrical interactions between the molecules. And what about the air resistance? fluid friction. In the air, we have many molecules. We have oxygen gas, we have nitrogen gas, we have hydrogen gas, and we have also dust particles, okay? We have carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, okay? Many, many molecules in the air. And during this type of movement, there is a fluid resistance, or another name is the resistance of the air, and this is also based on the electric interactions, okay? It is not enough. Let me clean all these forces, and now just concentrate on this skier, on this guy. Human body, what about the human body? Human body is also made from molecules and atoms, okay? And all these electric interactions hold the atoms of the skier's body together, okay? 
So electricity is very important for our daily life. Only wholly non-electric force here is the gravity. So this is very nice example to show you the importance of electric forces. Okay, now let me continue with the conductors and insulators. So here we have many materials on the picture. We have here metal ball. Metals are very good conductors. And here we have copper wire. Copper is also very good conductor because it is metal, okay? Please also keep in your mind that metals also conduct the heat very well, okay? So most of the metals are good conductor of electricity and also a good conductor of heat, okay? Don't forget this one. And here on the right side, there is a plastic rod. Plastic rod is an insulator but it is charged and there are negative charges, okay? And here, there is an insulating nylon thread and there is another insulating nylon thread here, thread rope, okay? If uh, nylon is insulator, okay? And here we have a holder Probably it is also made from the metal, but since there is a insulating nylon thread here between this metal holder and metal ball, there is no electrical conductivity in between. And here we have a plastic rod. It is charged when you use this copper wire between metal ball and charged plastic rod, then you can transfer the electric charges through this copper wire to the metal ball, okay? So these are the conductors and insulators. And here we have information. I have already told you that copper is a good conductor of electricity. Nylon is a good insulator. The copper wire shown conducts charge between the metal ball and the charged plastic rod to charge the ball negatively. So finally, some part of this negative charges will move, will go to the metal ball through this good conductor copper wire. Do you have any question here? So as I told you, some part of this negative charge is transferred to the metal ball and this metal ball is also negatively charged, okay? Then I remove this copper wire. Then finally, I will have negatively charged metal ball a negatively charged plastic rod, okay? Since both of them are negatively charged, they will repel each other. And if you use a positively charged glass rod and make it close to the negatively charged metal ball, then they will attract each other. What about the electrical conductivity of glass? it can also be considered as an insulator, okay? So now let me continue with the charging by induction. What is the difference between charging by induction or charging by direct contact? Here, what we have done, look at this picture. Here we have negatively charged plastic rod at the beginning and we have neutral metal ball at the beginning. And by using the copper wire, there is a contact here, there is a contact here, and then we have charged this metal ball with the contact, okay? But it is also possible to charge this metal ball without any contact, just by induction, okay? Now we will learn this one, charging by induction. Here we have a metal ball again on the right side at top. It is neutral, there is no charge. And here there is an insulating stand, okay? So there is no charge transfer between ground 
and this metal ball because here we have an insulating stent. Then I use a negatively charged rod. Okay. And I bring this negatively charged rod near the metal ball and then these negative charges repel electrons within the metal to the right side and this side will be positively charged and this side will be negatively charged. Here it is important to remind you that actually within the metal we have many electrons, okay, and each electron has negative charge. And within the metal we have also positive charges, but in total the amount of positive and negative charges are equal to each other, okay, then it is neutral. But if I use a negatively charged plastic rod or negatively charged another material, this negative charges within the metal ball will be collected here in this region because these negative charges will repel these negatively charged electrons and positive charges will be attracted. You can consider like this, or you can say like this, electron deficiency will be produced here, okay? So electrons will be collected here. And then now what we have, now what we have here, the important thing is that there is no contact here, okay? There is no contact, just you bring the road near the metal ball and you collect the positive charges on the left side close to the road and you collect the electrons on the right side far from the road. Now, just use a metal wire to the ground and then you can take this negatively charged electrons from the metal ball, okay? but you are still keeping this negatively charged rod here. So these electrons are repelled with this negatively charged rod and they went to the ground and then you remove the wire. So finally, we have positively charged metal ball and here we have negatively charged ground. And in between, there is an insulator. Okay, so this is the charging by induction without any contact, without any physical contact. Okay, now we will continue with another important phenomenon, electric forces on uncharged objects. So we have learned that if you have positively charged material and here if you have negatively charged material, then there will be an attractive force in between. Or if we have a positive charge, if we have another positive charge, there will be a repulsive force in between. Or if we have negative charge here, negative charge here, and again, there will be repulsive force in between, okay? But let's consider that here, for example, you have positively charged material and here you have neutral material. What about the electric forces? And here you have negatively charged material and here you have neutral material. What about the electric forces in between? So look at the title, electric forces on uncharged objects. Here on the right side, I have uncharged object. Here I have positively charged object. Here on the right side, I have uncharged object. Here on the left side, I have charged object. So what about the electric forces in between? Look at this sentence. This is very important. A charged body like this one, positively charged or negatively charged, can exert forces even on the objects that are not charged themselves. So how it could be possible we have many examples. 
here, for example, a comb, okay, you electrify this comb, let's say you have negatively charged this comb, and here we have some bits of paper or plastic particles, okay, plastic sheets. So you will see that this charge comb will attract this papers or plastics, uncharged papers, uncharged plastics will be attracted by this comb, okay? Or just consider balloon. If you rub a balloon on the rock, or if you rub a balloon by using your hair, okay, then just hold the balloon against the sailing, what you will see, it will stick, okay, even though the sailing has no net electric charge. So now we will learn how it could be possible, what is the mechanism here for the electric forces on uncharged objects. I hope the problem is clear. Now I will go to the answer. The answer is the polarization, okay? It could be possible. It is possible due to the polarization effect. So here on the right side, I have a comb. This is negatively charged, okay? And on the left side here, I have a material, a neutral material, okay? It contains many molecules. And electrons in each molecule of the neutral insulator, just consider that this is insulator, it is not metal. It is paper or plastic, okay? And it is neutral, it is not charged. But electrons within this neutral material shift away from the comb because comb is negatively charged and here within this insulator i have electrons and electrons are repelled by this negative charges within the comb and you will see that positive charges will be closer to the comb in total there will be repulsive and attractive forces between comb and insulator. Let me draw it here. This is the comb, negatively charged. And here we have plastic particle. It has positive parts and also electrons, negative parts. So since there is a repulsive force between the electrons, negative charges, then electrons will be far from the comb and the positive charges within the insulator will be closer. So in total, there will be attractive and repulsive forces between insulator and comb, but since positive charges are closer to the comb, then attractive forces will be bigger than the repulsive forces and then this comb will attract this neutral plastic particles or neutral papers. Is it clear? Do you have any question here? So this is called as polarization. Within the insulator, look at this picture here on the left side. Within the insulator, there are positive charges and negatively charged electrons, okay? And when I use here a negatively charged material, then electrons will be like this within the molecules and positive charges will be like this. So there will be a polarization, electrical polarization within the material. So due to this polarization, this insulator will be attracted by the negatively charged comb on the right side. Now let me continue with the positively charged comb. Now this is positively charged. So since here we have positive charges and within the insulator, electrons will be attracted and positively charged parts of the material will be repelled, okay? Then again, 
a polarization will occur, but now the direction of the polarization is opposite compared to previous case. And then here I have positive charges, here I have negative and positive charges. Negative charges are closer to the comp, then the material will be attracted. Now, this condition, a charged object of either sign, positively charged comp or negatively charged comp, exerts an attractive force on an uncharged insulator every time. Okay, here I have a comp negatively charged. Here I have a neutral plastic, okay, uncharged insulator. It will be attracted. And then here I am using positively charged comp. And again, here I have a neutral insulator, uncharged insulator, and it is also attracted by the comp. And the mechanism explained by the polarization, okay, in both cases. Okay, now let me continue with the electrostatic painting. Here you see a door of a car. It is used in the automobile industry, also used in many field of many field of industry. Electrostatic painting is very important method. And what we have here, this is the door of a car. Okay, and you would like to paint this one. It is metal, aluminum, okay? And then you use a ground. Positive charge is induced on the surface of the metal. So all parts of this door are positively charged. Then here we have paint sprayer. Here we have a liquid paint, okay? And then you use air here, pressurized air, let's say, okay? So when this paint is moving through this nozzle, paint is charged negatively, okay? So then you produce this negatively charged paint droplets. This metal door is positively charged, and here you have negatively charged paint droplets, then there will be attractive force in between, then this paint will go to the surface of the metal object, and then it will stay there due to the electrostatic forces. And for this reason, the name is electrostatic painting. Okay, very important in applications. And now let me continue with the bio application electric forces, sweat, and cystic fibrosis. What about the relation between cystic fibrosis and electric forces? You know, the sweat is ter in Turkish, okay? Cystic fibrosis, a kind of illness. So you would like to test that if someone has cystic fibrosis illness, okay? So how to test this one? One way to test for the genetic disease, cystic fibrosis, after this point, we call it CF, cystic fibrosis. Here also it is written, where is it? Cystic fibrosis and any other? Yeah, here is, is it is also stated cystic fibrosis, okay? So in order to test whether this guy, this child, for example, has cystic fibrosis disease, you can measure it with the salt content of a person's sweat. Here, there is a sweat on the surface of the skin, okay? And you can check the amount of salt within the sweat of this person. So what is sweat? Sweat contains water and salt, okay? It is a mixture of water and ions, including positively charged sodium ions and negatively charged chloride ions. 
that make up ordinary salt, sodium chloride, when sweat is secreted by epithelial cells, some of the chloride ions flow from sweat back into these cells, a process called reabsorption. Just consider that this is the skin, okay, and this is the body. This is the skin. I am not medical doctor, I am not biologist, but just representation. And here there is a sweat, ter. Okay, so this sweat contains water and sodium and chloride ions. Okay, so look at this one. When the sweat is secreted by epithelial cells, some of the chloride ions flow from sweat back into these cells. So within this sweat, we have negatively charged chloride ions and some portion of this chloride ions will go back. Okay. Since they are negatively charged, they will also attract positively charged sodium ions within the sweat and sodium ions will also go back. Okay. This is called as reabsorption mechanism. So water molecules cannot flow back into the epithelial cells. So sweat on the skin has a low salt content. Okay. So then some part of the salt will be flowed back. Okay. And then this sweat will contain less salt. Okay. It contains water. However, this part is very important related to the cystic fibrosis. In persons with cystic fibrosis, the reabsorption of chloride ions is blocked. Chloride ions cannot go back into the epithelial cells. Hence, the sweat of persons with cystic fibrosis is unusually salty. So here there are sweat, for example, but they are very salty because they contain huge amount of salt, okay, compared to the normal person. I mean, it is up to four times the normal concentration of chloride and sodium ions in a normal person. So this is the relation between electric forces and cystic fibrosis. So as I told you at the beginning of my lecture, I will show you many other examples in order to explain the importance of electricity and electric charges in biology, in medicine, for our daily life, electricity, electric charges and magnetism are very important topics and this is very important by your example. So now let me continue with this part, measuring electric force between point charges. So now we will do that. Here I have positive charge and here I have negative charge. And as you expect, there will be attractive forces. This positive charge will be attracted by this negative charge and this negative charge will be attracted by this positive charge. OK, so there will be attractive forces in between. But how to measure this force? What about the magnitude of this force? How to measure it? It is studied by Klomp in 1784 and he used a torsion balance. What is torsion balance? Here on the right side, there is a torsion balance. This is the torsion fiber. Torsion fiber. Okay. And then here we have a scale. You see? And here, this is torsion fiber, and we have positive charge on the right side of this system and here positive charge here on the left side of this system and here we have another ball with which is negatively charged let me clean actually they don't touch each other okay 
So these are charged pistols. Here we have two positively charged pistols, and here we have one negatively charged pistol, which is shown with the blue color. Okay, so since there is an attractive force between this positively and negatively charged pistols, this ball will be attracted. This is fixed. Okay, this cannot move. But this positively charged ball with the red color can move. Okay, but torsion fiber resists against this. Okay, then you can you can measure it. Okay, so the negatively charged ball attracts the positively charged one. The positive ball moves until the elastic forces in the torsion fiber balance the electrostatic attraction. So this torsion fiber would like to move this positively charged ball back, but this negatively charged ball attracts the positively charged ball. Then at certain distance, electrostatic force is balanced with the elastic force. Okay, this is the electrostatic force and this is the elastic force. We have learned elastic force during the physics one lectures. Okay, this is the measuring electric force between point charges. And what about the force between negative and positive charges or positive and positive charges or negative and negative charges? So Klomp found that the magnitude of the electric force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between charges. So there is a distance here, you can say D or R, distance here, distance here. So the force, attractive or repulsive forces, strongly depends on this distance between the charges. Okay, then this is the Klomp's law. It explains the force, electrostatic force, between the charged particles. This is the Q1, charge of one ball. This is the Q2, charge of the another ball. And this is the square of the distance in between. And this is constant, okay, K. Now here, on the right side, we have a positive charge. And here we have another positive charge and the distance in between is given with R. Since they have same positive charge, then they repel each other. They have same sign and then they repel each other. So this is the force one on this charge produced by this Q1. And this is the force two on this Q1 produced by this Q2. So in terms of direction, what do you see here? Look at the direction of the force. We have learned in physics one that force is a vector and it has magnitude and direction, right? So what about the direction of this force? It is in this direction, but this is opposite to the other force. So directions are opposite to each other, but what about their magnitudes? In magnitude, they are same, okay? Because it is given with K times Q1 times Q2 over R square. So if you use negatively charged particle here or negatively charged object Q1, then this Q1 will be attracted by this Q2 with this force F2. And this Q2, this positively charged particle, will be attracted by Q1, and this is F1, okay? So what about the direction of the forces? Direction of the forces are opposite to each other again, but both of them would like to move to the neighboring charge, okay? Then it is attractive. So this part is repulsive, and this part, this condition is attractive, okay? And the force in between in both conditions is written with this expression. This is the magnitude of the force. 
and given with the Clomb's law. Okay, now let's discuss some fundamental electric constants and then I will show you a few examples and I will finish this part of my lecture. The SI unit of electric charge is called one clump, okay? This is the unit of the electric charge. And here you have seen a K. Let me clean this part of the transparency. Here there's a K, you see? What is this K? K is constant and magnitude of this K is given with roughly nine times 10 to nine Newton meter square per Coulomb square. This is the constant, okay? Instead of K, we can use this expression. This is equal to K, one over four pi epsilon zero. Here we have epsilon zero. Epsilon zero is electric constant, four constant number, pi is also constant number, then here we have another constant K, okay? These are the values of the two charges Q1 and Q2, and this is the square of distance between two charges. This is the Clomb's law. It gives us magnitude of electric force between two point charges. And what about this electric constant here, epsilon zero? It can also be written here in some books like this. Okay, you can see both symbols. This is epsilon zero. And epsilon zero is given with this expression. Nine times 10 to minus 12 C square over Newton meter square. Or it can be written with this expression. This is the K and I have already given the K here, okay? So for simplicity, it is taken nine times 10 to nine Newton meter square over Clomb square, okay, this one. These are the fundamental electric constants. And what about the unit of charge? As I told you, charge of the electron and also charge of the proton, proton is positively charged, electron is negatively charged, are the fundamental unit charges, okay? And in magnitude, they are equal to each other. And it is given with this one, E, and it is equal to 1.6 times 10 to minus 19 clomp. It is very small amount of charge, okay? Even in the problems and questions related to this chapter and also in the forthcoming chapters, usually within the problems and within the questions, you will see charges around one microclomb, okay? 10 to minus six clomb, or sometimes you will see one nano clomb, 10 to minus nine clomb, okay? Because usually point particles have very small charges. Okay, now let me show you two examples and then I will finish my lecture. We have an alpha particle. You know what is alpha particle? Alpha particle has two neutrons and two protons, okay? You can consider the nucleus of a helium atom. It has mass, 6.64 times 10 to minus 27 kilogram. There is a neutron here, there is a neutron here, there is a proton here, proton here, and in total, this alpha particle has this mass, which is given in the example. And this is the charge of the alpha particle. Where this charge comes from, here we have neutral neutrons, they have no charge, but here we have positively charged proton, and here we have positively charged proton, and we have two of them. In total, the total charge of this alpha particle is given with plus two E. Each proton has this charge, 
1.6 times 10 to minus 19 Coulomb, and we have two of them, then it is 3.2 times 10 to minus 19 Coulomb. This is the charge of the alpha particle. Okay, now let's come to the question. Compare the magnitude of the electric repulsion between two alpha particles with that of the gravitational attraction between them. Here we have one alpha particle, here we have another alpha particle. So what we have within the alpha particle, we have two neutrons, two protons, and it is positively charged in total. Here we have another alpha particle, it contains two neutrons and two protons. It is also positively charged in total, and there will be repulsive forces in between, okay? They will repel each other. And this is the electric repulsion between two alpha particles. And this alpha particle has certain mass, and this alpha particle has also the same mass, and due to the masses, there will be gravitational force, and it is attractive force, okay? Electrostatic force is repulsive, but gravitational force is attractive. We have learned gravitational force during the physics one. How to calculate this electrostatic force? Electrostatic force is given with Coulomb's law, one over four pi epsilon zero, Q square over R square. Q is charge of this alpha particle, Another Q is charge of this particle, alpha particle. Since they are same, I can write here Q square, and R is the distance. Distance is not given, but we will compare the electrostatic force and gravitational fo force between two alpha particles. What about the gravitational force? Gravitational force between two alpha particles can be written with G times M square over R square. M is the mass of the alpha particle, Actually, it is m1 times m2. Since they are equal to each other, I can write m square. And here we have r square. So the question is compare their magnitudes. Okay. Question is this one. One is electrostatic force. This is repulsive. And another one is gravitation force. This is attractive. So then just put this one here and just put this one here, then we will get this expression here. Q is given in the question, mass is given in the question. Here we have, we have epsilon zero, it is constant. Here we have G, this is also constant, okay? Then finally, this is the ratio in between 3.1 times 10 to 35 huge difference between electrostatic force and gravitational force, okay? You see, between alpha particles, there is a repulsive electrostatic force, and between two alpha particles, there is an attractive gravitational force, and this gravitational force is negligible, very, very small, you see? The other one, electrostatic force, is 10 to 35 times bigger than the gravitational force. Okay, so then you can understand the difference or you can compare these forces, let's say. Here in the evaluation part, there is very nice information. I like this type of information within this book. For this reason, I would like to repeat also this part this difference between electrostatic force and gravitational force shows that the gravitational force in this situation is completely negligible in comparison to the electric force. This is always true for interactions of atomic and subnuclear particles. If you are talking about the interactions between atoms or if you are talking about the interaction between protons and also interaction between protons and electrons, okay, in atoms. So 
this is the case. So electrostatic force is much bigger than the gravitational force in between. But within objects, the size of a person or a planet, for example, just consider this is the Earth. OK. And this is the guy here. Sorry for the sizes. OK, this is just representation. This guy has a mass, Earth has a mass, and there is a gravitational force in between, okay, attractive force. But what about electrostatic force between this guy and Earth? Within objects, the size of a person or a planet, the positive and negative charges are nearly equal in magnitude. So just consider human, okay? The net total charge on the person is zero nearly zero okay neutral earth is also nearly neutral you can consider okay there are many negative and positive charges but in total more is zero net charge okay for this reason for the big objects planets satellites the gravitational force is much bigger than the electrostatic forces okay so this is the comparison between electrostatic force and gravitational force. And let me finish my lecture with the last example, vector addition of electric forces in a plane. Here I have an XY plane. This is the X axis. And this is the Y axis. Here I have a positively charged particle. Here I have positively charged particle. And this is the origin. This is the distance from the origin. This is the distance from the origin. And here I have another positively charged particle. It has another distance from the origin. And this has Q1, 2 microcoulomb. This has Q2 charge, 2 microcoulomb. And this has this capital Q charge, 4 microcoulomb. Okay. And what about the electrostatic force? What about the electric force acting on this particle here? This is the question. Two equal positive charges, Q1 and Q2, two microcoulomb, are located at x is 0, y is 0.3 meter. They are located here. And what are the magnitude and direction of the total electric force that Q1 and Q2 exert on a third charge Q for microcoulomb at X is equal to 0.4 meter, Y is zero. So it is located here. So this is positive charge. This is also positive charge. Then this charge will apply this force on Q this is F2 on Q, and here this is positive charge, positive charge, and this will apply this force. This is F1 on Q. So as you can see, this force has X component and Y component. This force has Y component and X component. So since the distance between these two charges and these two charges are equal to each other, since the charge of these particles also equal to each other, then Y components of the forces will cancel each other. And here I will have only X components acting on this positive charge here along the X axis. Then I can calculate its magnitude. You know, it is calculated with Clomb's law, K times Q1 times, Q over R square, okay? And it is constant. Just put this constant here, K, nine times 10 to nine Newton times meter square per Coulomb square. And this is the charge of the Q here, capital Q. And this is charge of the Q1 or Q2, let's say. Then this is the distance in between. Then you can calculate magnitude of this force, but I need X component of this force, okay? In order to calculate X component of this force, I can use this formula, X component. It is given with this vector 
times cosine alpha. Here I have alpha angle. Here I have alpha angle. I know of this distance. I know of this distance. I can calculate cosine alpha. Okay, then X component is given with this one, 0.23 Newton. And I have two X components acting on this charge here due to Q1 and Q2. Then if I take some of them, the total net force acting on this capital Q charge along the X axis is given with 0.46 Newton. Okay, this is the vector addition of electric forces in a plane. Do you have any question here? Okay, if not, I would like to finish my lecture. On Thursday, we will continue with electric field and electric fields of electric typos. See you on Thursday. Bye-bye.